Hi guys, welcome to Mission Control Houston. I'm Kelly Humphreys and this is veteran astronaut Mario Renko. Uh, we are ready for your questions. Uh, do you want the students to be... Hi, this is Mrs. Sukumar uh, from Bedford High School. Uh, do you want me to um, ask the questions one at a time or do you want the students to be asking the questions? Uh, we'd love to hear it directly from the students, sure, uh, but they not? do need to speak up so we can hear their voices. And I want to make sure they know that uh, Mario knows New Jersey. He went to Rutgers University and uh, is originally from New York, so he knows your area. Very nice. So let's uh, start with Brant Wilson. He's a grade uh, 11 student. He's a junior at our school. Um, so Brant's question, here he goes, Brant. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Say again. How long have you been told to in space? How long have I been in space? Uh, I, I had done three missions. Uh, the first one was in 1991 on STS-44. That was with the space shuttle. And then I did two more space shuttle missions uh, in 93 and in 96. And the total time uh, among all missions uh, is uh, was about uh, 21 days total, which now it, days uh, compared to what the guys spend on the space station is a very small number. Okay, that's that's a great question, and just a reminder: be please get to the microphone and speak up uh, so we can hear you. It's a little hard. Sure. Um, so the next question is from Brian McLachlan. He's a great um, ninth student. He's a freshman. Brian, where are you? Uh, Brian's not here, but I'm going to ask uh, the question that uh, Brian had asked on his behalf. His question is, how is space always expanding, and where does it expand into? How and why is space expanding, and what is it expanding into? That is a great question that I don't think we know the answer to at this point. Uh, space is, is as far as we have sensed with our uh, Hubble Space Telescope and other uh, orbiting observatories like the Gamma Ray Observatory. We know that there are objects that we can see uh, and sense uh, out 13 billion light years uh, from Earth. So, and that's really the extent of, of the known universe. Uh, the objects in within that space, that the known universe, are expanding away from each other into uh, distances farther than uh, the 13 billion light years. Now remember, a light year is about 6 trillion miles. So I said 13 billion times 6 trillion. So that's the distance to the farthest known extent of the universe, at least today. And that's a darn good question. And maybe uh, Brian will be able to, to become the scientist that figures that out. You know, the other part of that is what exactly is in all of that space. And one of the experiments on the International Space Station, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, is doing sifting through the various cosmic rays and particles that come uh, to Earth to try to identify a little bit more about things like matter, antimatter, and this theoretical dark matter uh, that we believe exists because we can... In, in, indirectly sense that, but we don't have any direct measurements of that. Uh, and so it's a really interesting experiment, and having the space station orbiting the Earth uh, provides us the power to operate that outside the Earth's atmosphere and look more at what is in between the matter that we can see and sense. And we're ready for your next question. And I'm sorry, we're not able to hear that at all. Something must have happened to that microphone. I'm sorry, you may want to uh, check your microphone and, and verify that it's in a good location and plugged in. And while you're doing it, and while you're doing that, let me comment about what uh, Kelly had just said, and that is with uh, the dark matter. Uh, 
scientists believe that there is a, a construct, a, a, a thing called dark matter, and that's because, uh, for example, the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy, has matter in it, and it is spinning around in a disk-like fashion. But the rate of spin is, is such that the centripetal acceleration outward that would throw uh, the, the, the objects within the galaxy, like uh, the ball at the end of a string, when you let go of the string, they would fly outward and not stay as part of the galaxy. But there's enough gravity within that uh, galaxy to hold everything together. But the, the matter and the mass that we know of in the objects that we can see is not enough to do that. So they've invented dark matter to try and solve the equation so it makes sense. So there's something there, we just can't sense it, and we don't know uh, what it is. Now there is some, uh, there are th things out there called rogue planets that are like the Earth or Jupiter that do not revolve around a star, so they would be dark planets that we can't see. So maybe there's, that's one, maybe that's one possibility that's not so exotic that, that would account for that extra mass. Okay, I'm hearing that we may have gotten the audio connection fixed. You want to try another question, guys? Yes, we do. No, that's about. Oh, we can hear you now. Yes. How do you feel in space? Do you feel more inspired and at ease, or do you become cynical? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, I, I actually, it's the, it's the former. I, I feel very inspired and and uplifted and. Uh, and the reason for that is when you're in orbit around the Earth, you can see most of the Earth and, and indeed some of the uh, earlier astronauts who traveled farther away from the Earth, like those that went to the moon, could see the entire Earth at one time. And it, it is so spectacularly beautiful and majestic. And, and likewise, when you look out into the universe, you see the stars and, and, and the celestial sky in, in, much more, in a much more vivid fashion. And, and, and your being among them, uh, that in that setting just is is very exhilarating and and inspirational and 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 actually it, we had talked earlier Kelly and I about uh, some of the work we were doing uh, here at NASA that that is related to that in terms of uh, taking images of the Earth. All right, next question. Um, next question is from Michael Holmes. Uh, he's a freshman, and uh, his question is. What do you use to work out in space? Oh, good question. And you really need to work out in space. Uh, uh, I'll answer the, the, the question, but let me just say firstly that on Earth, gravity is working on us all the time. And for example, like my heart is pumping blood right now up against gravity to my head to keep me conscious so I don't keel over in the chair. And when gravity is removed, the heart doesn't have to work so hard. Yet when I come return to Earth, it has to go back into that environment. So we need to stay conditioned because muscles that you don't use, as everyone knows, tend to grow weaker. So we need to maintain at least the level of strength that we had when we left the Earth. And we use uh, uh, devices such as uh, ergometers and uh, treadmills and, and cycling machines and bungees uh, in a fashion that are all uh, designed using uh, springs and, and the like to mimic uh, gravity. For example, if I'm running on a treadmill, uh, there are bungee cords holding me to the treadmill such that I can actually run on the treadmill and, and, and it works. And, and then uh, uh, we use uh, bungees and stuff and spring-like things to, to mimic weightlifting and the like. So we try to do, and, and there are many devices that have been developed to, to uh, help and facilitate that uh, exercise protocol. And just to add on to that, uh, there are Bone density loss is another important thing when you do the long duration stays in space. Sure. And so doing this kind of exercise puts uh, uh, force onto your bones in the same way that you would put force on your heels when you walk. And that helps keep the bones strong, which is a really important thing. And research into that is also helping us solve problems that people have on Earth, like osteoporosis. Uh, some of your grandparents may have experienced that and have it's too easy to break a hip or whatnot because of that and some of the research in space is helping us apply what we're learning there uh, to diseases we have here on earth and so that's another part of exercise on orbit because these folks all come to, uh, stay up there for about six months and then they've got to readapt to being on gravity when they get home 
and in the case of osteoporosis, it happens uh, if we don't exercise, we tend to develop those symptoms in the very short period of time, in a matter of weeks and months. So we can study that, uh, whereas normally on, on a person on Earth, it would take a lifetime before they had develop any symptoms. So we have a, a very accelerated laboratory in which to develop uh, drugs and protocols to, to maybe address that. And that's what Kelly was talking about. And nutrition, too, because they're learning that nutrition and exercise in combination have a really important effect on how well you're able to keep fit aboard the space station. I'm sure you've heard that one before, too. Next question. Um, I'm John Gilbert. I'm a senior. I wanted to know, how did your Navy career prepare you to be an astronaut? Ah, good question. Uh, I my my Navy career. Uh, I was a meteorologist, oceanographer, and I was also a surface uh, ship uh, 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 watch officer. Uh, in the Navy, and uh, the scientific part of my background, uh, the meteorology, oceanography, uh, helped with my ability to understand all of the technical parts of uh, what is needed to operate in space, orbital mechanics and the like. So I have a very uh, rigorous uh, engineering scientific background. Uh, the Navy portion of it is uh, the crew of a ship, uh, much uh, like the crew of a, of a spaceship, uh, is is based in operations and and it's very similar when you're operating on board a, a ship or a submarine to when you're operating a, a, in a spacecraft as a crew. You learn to operate as a team. You learn your systems on the ship, and and indeed many of them uh, actually they are all the same, uh, save that uh, for example there's environmental systems on the ship as there are on a spacecraft. So uh, some of the hardware is different and how it is it functions is different, but the principle and and why it's there uh, is ba is basically the same. So it's it's a very very close one to one relationship between operating in a naval environment as a space environment. And interestingly enough, one of the crew members on the space station right now also is a Navy veteran. Uh, Chris Cassidy was a Navy SEAL. Next question. Uh, I'm Sean. I'm in uh, ninth grade, and I my question is, what made you want to be an astronaut? <laughs> Well, I've always had a, uh, a, a desire to, to learn new things and, and to understand uh, the, the universe, uh, what's out there. Uh, but very specifically, when I was very young, at age five years old, uh, the first uh, satellite went into orbit, Sputnik, and then uh, shortly thereafter, a few years later, uh, the first human beings, uh, Yuri Gagarin and Alan Shepard, went into orbit around Earth. and. Uh, I knew then that's exactly what I wanted to do, and I, I feel very, very fortunate and, and privileged to have had the opportunity to do so. And I'm very lucky <laughs> to, to be here sitting uh, talking to you about it. Go ahead. Yeah. What do you think is your most significant accomplishment in all your space missions? as an astronaut? Uh, my most significant accomplishment, the most memorable one uh, was the one uh, on my second mission was when I uh, did uh, a spacewalk. And and honestly, I, I, I guess the, the the, the most significant accomplishment uh, is is in my on my last mission is we had number of technology development experiments on board that spacecraft both on the uh, on the shuttle and others that we put overboard and, uh, and we tested uh, in in orbit alongside the space shuttle and in that sense is 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 those technology development experiments were pushing the boundaries of what our capabilities are to explore space so I guess that in my mind would be uh, something that that if we can move to a, 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 an area where we can uh, explore it more efficiently and, and and go farther out into space is is something that uh, I hope uh, uh, continues and I think some of those were directly applicable to the space station development weren't they uh, actually uh, yes uh, we had uh, uh, attitude control uh, satellite is called the satellite test unit it was a device uh, that we tried to use the forces in Earth orbit to uh, control the attitude of this uh, of the spacecraft, and and in a sense they do that a little bit with the with the space station. Uh, we've got gyros that move uh, through angular momentum that can torque the space station around. Uh, we also have thrusters, but we don't use those that often, and we try to keep the space station in an equilibrium point where uh, we don't have to use the gyros uh, even. But uh, uh, all three together hold uh, the spacecraft where it needs to be. Great. Another question? Um, 
How does your body shift to gravity? So no gravity, and how do you feel? <laughs> Well, uh, the body does a number of reactions when you get into uh, 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 space and you're in orbit and, and the gravity vector is removed primarily, and, and, and we had already discussed uh, some of that with uh, the, the bone density loss, the muscle uh, toning loss, but uh, the most immediate reaction that one feels is a fluid shift. And, and uh, again, I'm sitting here, or if I'm standing up, uh, gravity is working to hold my bodily fluids, the bloods, and in 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 my legs and and arms. If I have my arms at my side, uh, when you remove the gravity, that there tends to be a fluid shift out of the legs into the chest cavity and the head. And if you look very carefully at some of the pictures of the astronauts in space, they do look a little puffy, uh, a little more full than they do on the ground. Uh, and that is because of that fluid shift. Now, the, a consequence of that fluid shift is, is what we call space adaptation syndrome. Uh, it's not the same as, but it's not very much different as, it's hard to describe, as, as when you, if, if you go aboard a ship and you, and you have a tendency to be seasick, it, it, is, it is a similar reaction, uh, but, but not exactly. And, and you tend not to feel very comfortable. You got this, uh, maybe a headache. Uh, you might have some nausea. It depends on the individual. Uh, and what what's the good news is is that goes away after a few days. The body adapts. You tend to uh, uh, you know not notice it anymore. An analogy I would draw is if you ever had a, a tooth filled, uh, you know, with cavity, and you had a, a filling done or you had work done on your teeth. You know, the first day or two that you've had that filling, you tend to notice it. But then after a few days or three days, you don't notice it anymore. Uh, you you get used to that feeling, and it's it's sort of the same with space adaptation. Uh, syndrome. Okay, another question. Um, my name is Brian Brooks. I'm in ninth grade. I'm a freshman, and I wanted to know what does open space smell like? Did I get that right? What does space, smell, what does space <laughs> smell like? That's a darn good question. Actually, uh, the the direct answer is. Nobody knows because space would not have smell if you're outside because it's a va it's basically a vacuum, and there's no way to sense odors because we need atmosphere and air to, for, to pass over our nostrils to have a sense of smell. Having said that, there is a sense of uh, of, of odor in space, and and that tends to be like. Uh, new car smell, if you get into a new car, everybody, most people like the smell, uh, you, you take it in, and that is from the outgassing of the materials of which the car is made. And depending upon the spacecraft, in the case of the space shuttle, I was not aware of that. You, you kind of get used to it because you operate in, in, in a similar environment in simulators. You actually train in the space shuttle uh, at times before launch, so you're in the real vehicle. And uh, you're also in the, in, inside your suits at times. And, and what I noticed one time after being removed from the space shuttle after several years, I got back inside of one, and what what struck me was the odor, the the, the smell of the, the the space shuttle itself is that the that combined uh, collective of, of outgassing from the materials in the space shuttle, in at least in the case of the space shuttle, and it 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 hit me that that's the smell of space. So it's it's not really the 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 space space outside that smells. It's the the, the things that we bring with us that actually give us a sense of of orientation uh, for, from uh, a sense of smell perspective. Now, you're a veteran spacewalker. I understand there is a special smell that comes with coming back in the airlock after a spacewalk for some folks. Yes, it, 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 when you come back in and pop your helmet off, again, it's that, it's that, that odor of the spacecraft that 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 hits you that that uh, it, it it's it's like a sense of home. I mean, if if you walk into various uh, retail stores or somebody's home, there's a slightly different characteristic odor, and that and and that's you know if it's your home and that's just, and if it's something wrong or different, then you'll notice it. Okay. Well, I understand that's all the time we have for today. We want to thank you folks for being with us today. Uh, and thank you, Mario, My for pleasure. joining us and answering the students' questions. We hope you have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank you.